Please join me in the call to worship. People of God, we come today to worship the God of resurrection and new life, the God who created and sustains us and who offers healing of body, mind, and spirit, and who gave us strong people of faith to show us how to live in this world. Come now in body and spirit as we praise our loving God. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day, for we know that this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and we're glad to be with it. Be with us now on this morning as we come to worship with you through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Good morning and welcome to online worship here at Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church on this wonderful Sunday morning. As a reminder, if you haven't already gotten your elements for communion to uh, take part later in the service to maybe go and take care of that now. But as we come together on this Sunday morning, we missed you last Sunday. If you weren't a part of our virtual fellowship online, we had several people in the congregation come together. and We got to see one another and have some conversation and uh, kind of catch up of what's been going on during this uh, time of pandemic. Um, but if you missed it, you can tune in next month of the first Sunday of September. I believe it's September 6th. We are having another virtual gathering. And then also to know that Theology on Tap is coming back, but we're coming back online and that will be September the 3rd. And uh, a lot of those details are in the weekly and uh, will be on the website as well. So uh, keep in contact with us. Come and be a part of the church still, even though we're still virtual. So now as we continue with worship, let us hear God's word. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from Romans 11, verses 28 to 32, taken from the Inclusive Bible. With respect to the good news, there are enemies of God because of you. With respect to their call, however, they are beloved by the Most High because of their ancestors. For God's gift and call are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, and now have received mercy through Israel's disobedience, now they have become disobedient, since God wished to show you mercy, that they too may receive mercy. God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience in order to have mercy on everyone. May God bless the hearing of these words.
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, taken from the Inclusive Bible. Think of it as pure joy, sisters and brothers, whenever you face trials of any sort. You understand that your faith is put to the test only to make you patient. But patience, too, has its practical results, is to make you fully mature and lacking in nothing. If you lack wisdom, ask for it from God, who gives generously and ungrudgingly to all, and it will be given to you. But you must ask in faith, never doubting, for the doubter is like the surf tossed and driven by the wind. People like this must not expect to receive anything from God, for they are devious and erratic in all they do. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. Will you come to prayer with me this morning? Gracious loving God, as we come to you this morning, maybe more anxious than we normally are, we know that we are continue to be a part of what makes this upside down world. As we give continually and we give you praise and thanksgiving for all that you have woven amongst us, I ask that you keep us connected through our love and through all those things in our lives. So now, God, I ask that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this morning, and the words that come from my mouth, along with all the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. So, over the last few weeks, we've been engaged in this series titled, The World Upside Down. And over these few weeks that we have been equipping ourselves on how we should be thinking about these moments that we've been living in and how as believers we should be responding as our world is continually being turned upside down. This week I want to take a little bigger look at all of this and give us maybe a little bit broader picture of how five things the Bible possibly teaches us or that God is possibly even doing during this coronavirus. Now, a few weeks back, I stumbled across this short little book from an author by the name of John Piper, and his book was titled, The Corona and Christ. Now, I kind of asked myself this question, who has time to write and publish a book during a time like this? But Piper outlines these six things that God might be doing in a time of this, but I'm only going to deal with five of those this morning. So if you want to find out what number six is, you can just go online and get the book, The Coronavirus in Christ. A little brief PSA. I actually listened to it on Audible, which was great. And I'm sure you can also see it on Amazon. So first, before we jump into that, how can any individual claim to know what God is doing, let alone, know, let alone what God is even thinking in the realm of the world? But we're told in Romans 11 that God's ways are inscrutable. How unsearchable are the judgments and uninscrutable ways that we all know is on the mind of God? Now, if you're not in tune of what inscrutable means, it means unable to be known, or which will take me back to how we can claim to know what God is going through or what's going through the mind of God each and every moment. Maybe adding a little additional caveat is that we should approach this with caution, but know that God is not silent about what God is doing in the world. And the one of the primary purposes that we have a Bible to help us is to understand these purposes. Example, brief example, uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians that by reading the Bible, we can gain insight to the mystery of what God is doing. And in probably various places in the New Testament, the authors give us these handles to understand what God is actually up to. So even though we may not know exactly what God is doing every second in every situation, that God is always doing more that we can probably recognize, and how can we know this general pattern throughout all of this? We do have to understand that Jesus even criticized the religious leaders of the day for not understanding the meaning of the divine work of God. 
We hear Jesus at one point saying, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why don't you know how to interpret the present time? I think we need to remind ourselves that even when the word seems to be upside, the world seems to be upside down, that Jesus is still dead center in the middle of everything. So here goes the first three things that God may be doing in our lives. The first thing in the coronavirus is that God is giving us a world of a physical picture of the moment of horror and sin. Now we know that sin, of course, is why any misery and suffering even exists in the world that we live in, and that the words God uses repeatedly to describe the creation was good. God saw, God saw everything and it was good. And we know that the world and the word meaning good is a world, of course, without this coronavirus. Paul reminds us in Romans that because of sin, the curse of death passed on all humankind and that, that to all creation itself was subjected to this futility, this non-willing at least to be set free from bondage or even corruption. When we hear the words like futility or bondage or even groans, all the images of global devastations and misery, which are all because of the rebellious times and because of the rebellious things that we do in life. But for most of us, whether we're Christian or not, we live our lives probably never grasping what I call the true ugliness of sin. For many of us, we just don't think of it as anything bad. Instead, we make comments like, I need to be a better person, or I'm not perfect, or even God will forgive me. Piper states in his book that hardly anyone in the world feels the horror of preferring other things over God. Piper further stated that even those who lose any sleep over our daily belittling of God is a neglect and defiance. But now at the same time, how we feel of our physical pain and how indigent we become if God touches our bodies, meaning physical pain is God's trumpet blast to tell us that something is dreadfully wrong in this world. The next thing on the list is that God intends for this coronavirus to be a wake up call in order us to be ready for the second coming of Christ. Now, we know that Christian history is flooded with these many, many false predictions about the world. And even in this virus, I think we're just saying to us, wake up and smell the coffee. This world that we are living in will not last forever. That we need to think about the world that is, that is coming to us and prepare for what is ahead in our lives. None of us know when Jesus is coming back, but this particular signs of what could be possibly signs of who knows, maybe it's not far away. I mean, look, the last words of the New Testament of Jesus saying, surely I come quickly, is coming back. Now, number three on the list is that this coronavirus could be God's thunderclap to us, wanting us to realign our lives with the infinite worth of Christ. If you go into Luke, probably around chapter 13, a tower had collapsed on a crowd of people and 18 died. The people wanted to know if this was a specific judgment on those 18, like God was angry at all of them and saw them standing together and thought, now's my chance, and knocked the tower onto them and squashed them. All they wanted to know what the disaster meant for the victims of which Jesus responded with it immense of the rest for the rest of us. Disasters like these aren't usually God's specific judgment on someone, but they are a message to all the people to repent. Folks, sin is serious and disasters like this are gracious summons from God to repent and to be saved while there's still time. So let me ask you this, in your heart, is God calling you through this disaster to repent, to finally take your relationship with God maybe a little bit more seriously? Is God trying to wake you up? The gospel, of course, is not that one that you could ever love God enough to be worthy of. The gospel is 
that you haven't, but that Christ has paid that penalty for you and has offered to receive all of this fully on what was done. But when we do receive the life that we are surrounding ourselves with is one that we begin to pursue God above all things and to treasure and to obey what God has in our lives above everything and anything that we are living in the way of our life. So that's three down and maybe a few more to go here. But number four on the list is God uses us to distress as a stage to display that distinctive generosity to those who believe. Now, I'm not going to say too much on this as we've talked times and time before about this. But however, in these times, we as Christians demonstrate a very distinctive generosity towards the gospel as well as toward the people in our lives. Going back to Piper's book for just a moment, he says, it is not mere good feed to give Christianity its tang and luster. It is good deeds in spite of danger, and many non-Christians do good deeds. But seldom do they do them at great cost to themselves with the sole purpose of glorifying God, not themselves. It is in this time of distress that Christian generosity shines forth. We hear in Matthew that Jesus said, blessed are you who are the ones who revel and who are persecuted and that you utter all kinds against the evil and you are falsely accounted for. Rejoice and be glad for you are rewarded in great when you get to heaven. We also hear that you are the salt of the earth and that you are the light of the world for this season you will be the light of the world because you show generosity in times of distress. Now, the distress that Jesus is talking about here is persecution, not disease, but I think the point may be the same. Gospel-fueled generosity goes far beyond the bonds of normal human goodness, and lots of people are kind and gracious in a time of prosperity. When goodness and generosity are relatively easy, God is there. But when generosity is costly and when it comes at a great personal cost, that's when the gospel should shine forth. At the center of our faith is Jesus who laid down his life for his enemies. And in the moments like this, we should go forward in faith of self-sacrifice and not backwards in fear of self-preservation. It's times like this that we rise above our self-pity and go outward towards the danger courageously of that joy of doing good works and love that glorifies within God. This leads us to number five on the list that God uses the coronavirus to loosen the roots of settled Christians and to send them to the unreached peoples of the world. Now, Piper tells a story in his book that on January 9th, 1985, this pastor, an evangelical pastor in Bulgaria, was arrested and put in prison. His his crime was that he preached without government permission, and his trial was a mockery of justice, and he was sentenced to eight months in prison. During this time in prison, he made Christ known in every way he could. When he got out, he wrote, Both prisoners and jailers asked many questions, and it turned out that we had more fruitful ministry there than we could have ever experienced or expected in church. God was better served by our presence in prison than if we had been free in the world. This often is God's way, or as Piper says, the global scope of the seriousness of the coronavirus is too great for God to waste, that he's going to use it for great advance for the mission of the world. So those are some of the five things. And again, I'm not saying that I understand everything that God is doing in this situation or any situation, but at any given point, God, we know, is doing tens of thousands of different things in all of our lives as well as the possibility of some that we're not even aware of. But what I do know is that God is our sovereign and we're faithful fulfilling those purposes in our lives. God is shaking the world like an earthquake and calling us to repent while at the same time purifying us as a church, waking us up and repositioning us to get God's presence out to the world. 
So don't waste this coronavirus on things that have no meaning, but get reconnected with God. The God who might be doing the things in life during this season that we may not be aware of or we may be aware of. Let the gifts that God comes to us be the gifts as we persevere forward, as we be those gifts, as we continue to let God shine through us each and every day. So my blessings to each of you this morning, Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. Let us be the gifts that God gives. Amen. Hey everyone. Well, I decided to do this video unscripted. The last one I did, I wrote out. And I just figured, you know what, I'm going to wing it and it's be more authentic that way. So, my name is Britt Saunders and I'm a member of the board and I bring you all greetings from the board of directors as well as Reverend Tory. And I'm updating you on my life from my lovely balcony here in Bayview, uh, my nice little private outdoor space that I'm happy I don't have to share with anyone so I can go mask-free out here. Also enjoy, you know, a cup of coffee, a glass of wine, what have you, in full view of the neighbors and, you know, say hello to everybody. And, uh, you know, in light of that, I hope everybody else has something like that they can do, Somebody, something you can do, I should say. Uh, to greet people, to participate without having to be part of a crowd or be in a crowd. So uh, life has pretty much continued on the status quo for me. Uh, I'm working hard. My business is back in full force. And uh, you know, I clean for all my clients wearing masks. I'm still doing the uh, aforementioned grocery runs for a few of my people who are still shut-ins. Wish I could do that for my mom in California. Uh, there's a need for that everywhere. Um, but I enjoy doing it. I enjoy the spirit of contribution and, uh, you know, it, it makes me feel better. So, uh, there's that going on. I have gotten my hair cut a few times. That's a great thing to be able to do again. Uh, again, with careful guidelines, wearing masks, both me and my stylist. Uh, and, you know, she, like a lot of other people who were out of work for a while, struggled in, uh, getting back on her feet, but she's got a great spirit and, uh, a go-getter attitude, and I really admire that. So uh, I wish that for all of you, too, because I know this is a stressful, difficult time. It has been for me. I'm starting to feel the weight of this thing um, more. Uh, a couple of my tenants had COVID, and I know uh, other people have had it. And uh, they've recovered, thankfully. And so I'm very grateful and very happy for that. And uh, so, and I remain healthy, and I'm glad that I remain healthy. And I hope that all of you are healthy and happy. And uh, the church is coming together great. We're going to have a fantastic place to worship once we're able to go back. But, you know, we all need to buckle down and prepare for this to be for the long haul because it is going to be. And I know everybody wants to be safe rather than sorry. I certainly do. Uh, I was planning a trip to California to visit my mother this month, and she's a no to that, and I'm a no to that. So just stay safe and you know, be conscientious, and all of you be well. And anyway, uh, so I wish everybody a great week and a great month. I hope you all are continuing to enjoy the great weather whenever you're able to. Get outside, uh, you know, see friends on whatever limited basis you choose. But most of all, just know that uh, we, the Board of Directors and Reverend Tory, are all thinking of you and uh, hoping that we can all get together and worship again, probably sometime after the, the new year. But it'll be great to see everybody. All right, take care. Bye-bye. As we come to the time of offering, this morning, as I pondered what I was going to say to you this morning, I really want you to stop and, and really hear this. As a small congregation, God has continued to bless us. Bless us through your giving, from your tithing to your giving, to your support above and beyond what you committed to. We are thankful that we are able to continue to pay our bills, to pay pastor, to keep the lights on, and to bring these online worships to you. So this comes as a reminder to you, really as this time of offering, to just gently remind you that this might be the time to write out your check and send it into the church. Certainly if you need more envelopes, you can leave a message at the church and we'll mail some more out to you. Or you can go online to our website and go there and make your donation by credit card or ACH or go to the PayPal and make a donation. We certainly appreciate it all and I hope you all feel God's blessings in the fact that we are able to meet our obligations. I wanted to also say this morning that normally this time of year we would be having our rummage sale as one of our big fundraisers for the year. 
as you're all aware, we can't do those sort of things. So your gifts or your extra gifts are especially important at this time of year. God bless you all. So as we come to the table this morning, if you haven't already done so, I invite you to maybe get something that represents communion for you this morning. Know that as we are, the gifts that God gives us at this table is for each and every one of us. Whether it's here, it's at home, or wherever, the gifts that God gives us are those elements. We know that on that night that Jesus was taken from us and at the meal that he was at, he took bread at the end of the meal, blessing it and breaking it and saying to each and every individual to take and to eat for this is my body that is given to you. But eat of this often and as often as you eat from this, do so in remembrance of me. At that same meal, Jesus took the cup from the table. He blessed it and he said to everybody that this is the cup of that new covenant that is poured out. It is my life. It is the gift that is given for each and every one of us, but it's the forgiveness of the sins that have been instilled upon us. But you're to drink of this often, and as often as you drink from this cup, do so in remembrance of me. As we take the gifts of the, the bread and the cup this morning, as you consume your elements, let that be the gifts knowing that God is within us and that gift that God has given us through Jesus. So will you pray with me? Help us to listen to your welcome to this feast that God has gathered us and you have poured out the spirit of the gifts that are made ready for us. May we understand that it's not just the crumbs but all of your justice offered in the bread so as we eat, we may go to bring wholeness to the shattered by the world's fears. Help us to recognize that this is not just a few drips but it is all of your grace poured into this cup. So as we drink it, we will go to do what is right, opening the doors to outsiders, gathering outcasts into our families. And when we know that the last of you calls us, as we gather around the feast of the lamb and the table, that we will join with all people in praising you, God in community, holy and one. Amen. conclude another great morning of worship with one another online I just remind you to continue to stay connected with each and every one of us know that your board and myself that we're available we're here for each and all of us during this time of craziness in our lives but know that we still are the church I invite you to continue to stay engaged in the offerings that we have throughout the months ahead and to stay a part of who we are 
But now as we go out into the world this day, knowing that when we are not here in the church, that we are still the church in our homes, in, in, our, in our environment, in everything that we do, that you are the church. It's not the building. So as we go out into the world this day, each and every day through God's protection and tender mercies and protection that is given to each and every one of us, let us go out into the world through God the Creator, God the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.